Welcome to our, the first of our spring series of ISTS uh, seminars, co-sponsored today by the Computer Science Department. So it's a CS colloquia and an ISTS seminar. You're getting both at the same time. Uh, we're having a series on, you know, given, given the events uh, that have been revealed in the news, uh, in this age of big data, uh, questions of government surveillance and surveillance by other parties, uh, take on kind of a new, uh, a new meaning and uh, kind of right at the core mission of uh, security, technology, and society. Uh, so the first of our speakers in the series uh, is Professor Ed Felton of Princeton. Uh, he's done over his career all sorts of amazing security work, and privacy work, and applications in various real world and uh, uh, policy settings. He's the, uh, the director of the Center for Information Technology Policy at uh, Princeton. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Ed speaking about technical trade-offs in the NSA mass phone call data program. Ed. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so the story that I want to talk about started back last June uh, with the revelation first in The Guardian and later in other uh, press outlets that the NSA uh, National Security Agency was collecting phone records uh, initially of millions of Verizon uh, customers on a daily basis. But then we later learned also phone records from um, many other uh, phone providers in the U.S. Um, and um, that, of course, has kicked off a, a big policy debate. Uh, all kinds of action in, in, in Washington, lawsuits and politicking and angry letters and speeches. I'm going to talk about a little of that where it touches the technical issues that I want to talk about today. Um, but what I really want to talk about today is some of the computer science issues that uh, are raised by programs like this. Uh, I want to talk, I'll talk a little bit about where we are and how we got here. Um, I'll, uh, and then I'm going to look at two specific questions that are suggested by this program. And I'll try to use some, uh, some uh, computer science methods to shed light on these questions. The first question is, how useful is this program actually in trying to find bad guys? Uh, the rationale for the program is that it's supposed to help intelligence analysts figure out uh, which individuals within the US either are or might be uh, involved in terrorism or spying for, uh, for, for hostile foreign governments. And, and I'll ask uh, how useful a program like this actually uh, might be in practice for that purpose. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about the question of whether a program like this can be made more privacy friendly while still being useful for its stated purpose. Uh, and then I'll offer some concluding thoughts. But before I get started, I want to dispel one possible misconception. And that is the misconception that this program has been shut down or is going to be shut down, and therefore we don't need to talk about this. Now it's true that uh, there have been various speeches made uh, in which public figures said that this program was going to be shut down. But in fact, what's really happening is that the program is being redesigned in some modest ways. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But suffice it to say for now that despite what you might have heard in speeches, uh, this program is still going on and other programs will be going on and other programs like it still are happening. Okay, let me talk first about what we know about what has been going on um, for the last several years. All right, uh, so with respect to phone call data, for many or most, there's some debate, uh, but in, in any case, for at least many domestic phone calls, the NSA has been collecting so-called metadata information. That is information about, for each call, who called whom, when the call was made, and for how long they talked. Uh, this is uh, often called metadata. Um, now, one thing to watch out for is that if you're a computer scientist, the term metadata probably means one thing to you. The term metadata means something a little bit different in this setting. Metadata in this setting just refers to information um, relating to a call or a communication other than the content. So that's information like who called whom, when, and so on. For an email, the so-called metadata might be who the sender, receiver was, what the time of the message was, and how big the message was but not the content or the subject line, and so on. So the NSA has been collecting uh, phone metadata, and I'll talk here about phone metadata, although we know that there's been collection of metadata about some other forms of communication as well, such as email. But because the phone metadata was uh, disclosed first, and because uh, pretty much everyone uses the phone, while still not everyone uses email, um, the phone data has become the political hot potato. Okay. Now, 
uh, what, I, what I told you so far, this metadata, this information is for domestic to domestic calls. For calls that are either entirely foreign, for uh, foreign to foreign calls, or for calls that are one end foreign and the other end of the call is domestic, uh, then we know that metadata is being collected. Um, and in some cases, content is being collected. For example, it was revealed recently that in at least one unspecified country of the world, not the US, that the NSA is collecting essentially every content of essentially every phone call in that country um, and putting it in a kind of giant uh, DVR that allows them to rewind and replay any phone call from the last month in that country. Uh, they, um, we know that they're, they're not doing that in the US, but they are doing that in some places. So I'm going to talk, focus here specifically on the entirely domestic case. In the foreign case, the legal trade-offs are different. The policy, the policy uh, implications are different and still complex, but I'm going to focus on the domestic case. Okay, so what does the agency do with this data once they get it? They do a bunch of things, but I'm going to focus on one particular thing they do, and that is that they build a data structure that I'll call the call graph. This is a graph in the computer science sense. That is, it's a set of nodes that are connected by a set of edges. There's a node for every phone number. Um, so if you're thinking of a diagram, think of a, of, of, a, of a circle on that in the diagram, a little circle. And there's an edge between two nodes if those numbers have talked to each other at all within the last five years. So that's the call graph. So they build the call graph, and then they do various computations on the call graph. Um, and in particular, there are two computations that they do. Contact chaining, and then something that's always redacted in the documents. Uh, so we know that there is a second thing because if you read the documents, for example, the intelligence community has released uh, the court orders from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court that authorize the collection of this data domestically. Uh, and those court orders say that the agency can collect the data subject to certain rules and that they're allowed to use the data for certain forms of analysis that are enumerated in the court order. And the court order says contact chaining and there's a bunch of discussion about that. I'll get to that in a minute. And then after they talk about contact chaining, it says also, and then there's a big block of redacted text, typically two-thirds of a page or so. Uh, and whenever there's discussion later or elsewhere in these documents of the algorithms that are done, there's some discussion of contact chaining, then typically there's a footnote and there's a bunch of redactions down there. So we know that there's something else that's going on, um, and I'll speculate a little bit later about what it might be, uh, but we don't have confirmation at all. And as you'd expect, if we're going to do analysis of these algorithms and their efficacy and so on, it's going to be a lot easier to analyze number one than number two. <laughs> but, we'll, but we'll make an effort. This is actually one of the challenges in dealing with the policy and technical issues around a program like this, that we have incomplete information. We have some information which was leaked. Um, we have some information which, is, um, which has been willingly released by the intelligence community by the White House, by the Department of Justice, and we can look at all of that and we can make whatever inferences we can carefully make from the documents that are available. Some of the most valuable documents are actually completely unclassified documents that were released by parts of the intelligence community just before the Snowden revelations. Uh, because, uh, for example, we can see uh, some topics that were of interest to the research arm of the NSA just before it became public knowledge um, uh, what their secret program, what some of their secret programs were. Okay, so um, let me talk now a little bit about the implications of the collection of this metadata. Uh, and I've written a bunch about this. I filed a, uh, an affidavit in uh, one of the court cases about this talking about the implications of metadata. I testified at a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing about the same thing. Uh, and I want to talk briefly about sort of what my basic analysis of this has to say. And if you are a privacy person, none of this will surprise you. But basically, you sometimes hear this argument that says it's only metadata. It's not really a big deal from a privacy standpoint. Um, and that turns out, that argument turns out not to stand up very well. Uh, that is, even though it is only metadata, that is, it's only information about who called whom, when, and for how long, that turns out to be pretty revealing. And in many respects, more revealing than content would be or at least more useful to an analyst. Why is that? Well, for one thing, many calls are in their nature sensitive. So for example, imagine that someone calls the suicide hotline at 1.15 a.m. and they talk for 40 minutes. Right now, you don't know anything about what was discussed, um, at least ostensibly, but you know what was discussed. 
right? Just the fact of that call at that time for that duration reveals a lot. And there are a lot of calls that people make that reveal information. You get a call from the appointment reminding service, from the appointment reminder service used by the local oncologist. That tells us something. Um, you make a call to the personnel office of your employer's competitor or you're an employee of a government agency and you call the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline at the inspector general's office at your agency. You pretty much know what these calls are likely to be about just from the nature of the call. And a surprising number of phone numbers are, uh, have that nature, that, they, that number exists to be called for a single or to make a call for a single reason. And so just the existence of a call reveals interesting information about something. Patterns of calls even more so. Uh, if, if two people uh, have a pattern of, let's say, a long late night calls, that might tell you something about their relationship. Or a back and forth between two people tells you that something is going on. Uh, perhaps you can tell that someone is shopping for a divorce lawyer uh, by a series of calls that they make. Or perhaps you can tell that two businesses are merging or somebody's thinking of moving or other kinds of decisions that someone is considering and you can tell that they're doing research to try to figure out uh, how to make that choice. Patterns of calls can be especially revealing in this way. Uh, and then finally, even beyond individual calls and patterns of calls, um, uh, there's the whole idea of using big data type of analysis to try to shed light on these things. What I mean is this. Suppose that you have a large volume of call data about a lot of individuals. And you know some things about some of those individuals. Uh, you can use standard kind of data analysis, machine learning type of methods to build a predictive model that will allow you to predict from a person's phone metadata some aspect about them. Whether it's their relationship status, their age, whether they have a job, whether they're a student, how happy they are in their relationship, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of different things about a person, including things like socioeconomic status um, the, um, or, uh, or different kinds of even medical conditions can be inferred. And there's a whole literature that uh, in the open research literature about these things and, and in my um, in my uh, court affidavit, for example, I cited a bunch of those things. But if you just think about it and you understand how these things work, you can see why this would be the case. And of course, who has the largest um, data set of, um, uh, of phone call data way larger than anyone in the open research literature has access to? The very same agencies whose analysis we're maybe worried about. So there's lots of reasons to think that metadata is particularly sensitive. And in fact, uh, we know that in settings where uh, intelligence analysts have access to both metadata and content, they often prefer to use metadata simply because metadata is structured and it's much easier to build, say, a graph algorithm that's going to run on that metadata than to mess around with content analysis and dealing with all the ambiguities of speech, especially speech in many languages. Okay, so metadata turns out to be fairly, um, to be fairly sensitive and um, uh, and other studies show this as well. Um, my ex-student, Jonathan Mayer, who's currently a, a, um, uh, a PhD student at Stanford, did a study recently uh, in which he and colleagues asked about 500, and got about 550 volunteers to hand over their phone call metadata by basically running an app on their mobile phone that would collect it. And they found that out of those people, uh, about 1% had metadata that directly revealed uh, some sensitive information. For example, that one subject of the, um, uh, that one subject of the study uh, has cardiac arrhythmia for which they're using a particular brand of, uh, of monitoring device. Uh, that one person is, uh, is subject to, uh, that, that one of the people has uh, recurring multiple, sc multiple sclerosis and is taking a particular drug to treat it. Uh, and information of that specificity that could be, uh, that could be gleaned from the metadata of, um, of participants in the study. And about 1% of the, of the people uh, had inferred directly from their metadata by a couple of graduate students just Googling around um, were able to, uh, to determine something quite sensitive about the people. So uh, this is a thing that we know happens even with relatively casual investigation. Okay, so all of this um, as well as a public outcry at uh, the collection of this data has led to suggestions for reform. Uh, one, of the, one of the sources of reform suggestions was uh, this study, which was issued by the President's Review Group, which was a group of five uh, uh, experienced Washington lawyers who were asked by the President to take a look at the, um, uh, at the NSA's uh, data collection programs 
operating domestically and to make recommendations. And they issued this, um, this um, uh, amazingly substantive and thoughtful report after a, a relatively short study. They issued this back in December. And I want to focus on two of the things that they said in this report. First, they said uh, that our review suggests that the information contributed to terrorist investigations by the use of this metadata was not essential to preventing attacks and could readily have been, the information could readily have been obtained in a timely manner using conventional court orders. So that's a finding that, the, uh, that based on not only what was available publicly, but also based on uh, access to uh, the NSA and their records at a classified level, um, uh, a judgment that this program was maybe not as useful as had been previously claimed. They also made a recommendation. Uh, and the recommendation number five said, we recommend that legislation should be enacted that terminates the storage of this data by the government and transitions as soon as reasonably possible to a system in which the metadata is held instead, either by private providers or by a private third party. Now, the president on January 17th gave a speech in front of a large number of flags in which he, uh, in which he responded to this report uh, and es essentially endorsed both of, these, uh, both of these statements. Well, he, I, I'm sorry, he didn't, so, he didn't endorse so much the first one as said that, um, that um, he wanted it studied further, but he endorsed the second recommendation uh, toward restructuring the program. So I'd like to, in the next two sections of the talk, uh, talk about these two recommendations, or these two statements, in the review group report. First, this question of how useful is this program in finding bad guys? And second, can it be restructured in a way that makes it more privacy friendly so that the government isn't holding the data? All right, first, how useful. And to get a handle on this, we're going to build a, a sort of simple probabilistic model of what's going on. And that model will be based around a certain scenario. The scenario is this. First, an intelligence analyst has some evidence suggesting that some person who we'll call Bob might be a terrorist. Second, the analyst is going to use the call graph information and determine whether Bob is in the near neighborhood of someone who we'll call known bad guy. Known bad guy is somebody who is known or very strongly suspected to be a terrorist. And so, um, um, and, and we're gonna see whether Bob is in the near neighborhood of this, in this graph of known bad guy. And I'm gonna be a little bit vague for now about what I mean by near neighborhood, I'll get precise later. Um, but uh, we're gonna say that if Bob is in the near neighborhood of known bad guy, then this is some evidence that Bob might be a terrorist. It might be weak evidence of that, but it at least points, it points at least a little in the direction of Bob being a terrorist. If not, if Bob is not in the near neighborhood of known bad guy, then we're gonna consider this to be possibly weak evidence, but evidence that Bob might not be a terrorist. Okay, and now we can look at, um, under various assumptions, we can look at this kind of model um, by using uh, probabilistic reasoning um, and if you are, uh, 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 and, and we're going to use what amounts to uh, a Bayesian reasoning. And Bayesian reasoning can be written in equations, but instead of writing in the equations, I'm going to use this kind of table. And this table considers four different combinations of events. We have columns in which Bob is a terrorist or not, and we have rows in which Bob is in the near neighborhood of known bad guy or not. So this gives us four boxes, and we can talk about the probability that we happen to be in each one of these boxes, and then we can ask questions like, um, if we see that Bob is in the near neighborhood, what's the probability that he's a terrorist, and so on. So if you're a person who likes equation and are comfortable with Bayes' law, you can imagine that I wrote up here equations, but it's the same thing. Okay, now let's make some assumptions, um, or at least define some parameters. So first we're gonna say that there's some probability that Bob is a terrorist, which we'll call T. So this is the prior probability that Bob's a terrorist. In other words, the analyst we assumed has some evidence that points the finger at Bob. And based on that evidence, and that evidence alone, but without looking at the call graph yet, T is our best estimate of the probability that Bob is a bad guy. And our goal is starting with that probability of T, we're going to refine it by looking at the call graph. Okay, now we're gonna say that, the pro that if Bob is a terrorist, then the probability that he's in the near neighborhood of the known bad guy will be some value alpha. Um, and this basically, we can assume that Bob and known bad guy, being smart terrorists, are trying to avoid being in each other's near neighborhood. And this is basically the probability that they mess that up and end up in each other's near neighborhood, which is a surprisingly high probability. I mean, imagine some person that you know, and you try to go five years without, A, without ever talking to that person on the phone, 
and b, without ever talking to a person who has talked to that person on the phone. Imagine that you and someone who you know in your social circle wanted to do that and you wanted to maintain that for five years. It would actually take a lot of discipline because after all, you might call the pizza joint that is the same pizza joint they called. It can be pretty hard to stay out of the near neighborhood of someone if you are actually close socially. So we're going to assume that there's some non-trivial probability that they'll mess it up and we'll call that alpha. Okay. Now on the other hand, if Bob is not a terrorist, then the probability that he is in the near neighborhood anyway, we're going to call P sub n. This is basically, we'll assume that this is just the probability that any two people happen to be in the same near neighborhood. I mean, pick any two people at random, there's some chance they just happen to be in the same neighborhood. And we'll assume that that same, that sa that same probability holds for Bob and known bad guy. So this PN is the probability that any two people chosen randomly are in the same new neighborhood. Okay, so with these assumptions, we can fill in our boxes. It looks like this. Over here on the left, we have a probability of T that Bob is a terrorist. And if he is a terrorist, we are in the near neighborhood with probability alpha and not with probability one minus alpha. Over here, you're in this column with probability one minus T. And if you are, then your PN up here, you're in the neighborhood or one minus PN down here. Pretty simple. Right? And now we just need to figure out what these, probability, what these three parameters are. We can fill in the boxes and do some reasoning. All right, so let's make up some numbers. Um, let's say the probability that Bob is a terrorist, our prior, based on the evidence that the analyst has available to them, is 20%. Right? So just to pick a number out of the hat, Bob's probably not a terrorist. But actually, 20% is way, way, way higher than the probability that some random member of the population is a terrorist, which is probably less than one in a million. So 20% prior that Bob's a terrorist. We'll say that if he's a terrorist, there's a 50-50 chance that he is in the near neighborhood of known bad guy. Um, but we're going now, of course, the only, so the only thing that we have left is what's the probability that two random people happen to be in the same near neighborhood? So to do that, we can do various kinds of graph modeling. Um, and whoops, I went the wrong way. Um, and we can do a, uh, some kind of random graph model is the obvious thing to try to do. Now, there's lots of different ways we could define near neighborhood. There's lots of different ways we could characterize the graph. There's a giant literature on that. What I'm going to do is pick one way of doing those things, and I'll describe it to you. And then I'll come back later, and I'll argue that, in fact, those choices of what kind of graph we use and what the near neighborhood means uh, don't actually affect the analysis all that much. OK, so bear with me for now while I tell you a simple model I'm going to use. And then we'll come back and talk about how it matters. OK. So we're going to use a random graph model, and I'm going to use what's called an Erdos-Renyi model, which has two advantages. One is that it involves a lot of cool special characters that I can show off. Um, in, uh, I could show off my PowerPoint um, uh, special character ability. But second, it's a, it's a relatively simple model that, is, uh, that makes the analysis easy to follow. And the model is this. We have n nodes, that each pair of nodes is connected with probability epsilon, and those are all independent, so that any pair has an independent and equal chance. Uh, epsilon of being connected. And we're going to make some assumptions about the size of these things. That epsilon squared n is pretty small, and that's less than epsilon n. Epsilon n is the average degree of a node, so we're going to assume the degree is a lot bigger than 1. But we're going to assume that epsilon, this probability of connection, is very small. So what models could we, what values can we use? Well, here are some that are maybe a plausible guesstimate for uh, a US scale meta phone metadata graph that uh, there are about uh, 500 million, about half a billion nodes, let's say a half, half billion phone numbers in the US, uh, order of magnitude. We'll say that each probability, each pair is connected with probability one in a million, which means that the average node has about 500 neighbors. There are about 500 people that you talk to on average in a five-year period. And these assumptions at the bottom hold for these, uh, for these uh, values. OK, so now, uh, now, now that we have that graph, we can do calculations. And here's one calculation we can do. I won't walk you through it, but here's the result. If a near neighborhood means that the distance, the number of hops from one person to another, is less than or equal to 3, that is, if there's a path of length 3 or less from Alice to Bob, then, we, then we'll say that Alice and Bob are in the same near neighborhood. So if near neighborhood means that, then the probability that two random people in the US, two random nodes in this graph, um, are in the near neighborhood is about 22%. So with that, this PN is the last um, parameter. Now we can fill in our table, and it looks like this. So uh, you can see that most of the mass is down, is down in the bottom right, that in most of the time, Bob is neither a terrorist nor in the near neighborhood of known bad guy. Uh, but the rest piles up equally, piles up like this. 
Okay, now we can ask interesting questions like, what's the probability that Bob is a terrorist if he's in the near neighborhood? Well, um, if Bob's in the near neighborhood, that means that he's in the, um, he's in the top row here. So 10% of the time he'll be there and a terrorist. 18% of the time he'll be there and not a terrorist. So the probability that he's a terrorist, given that he's here, is 0.1 divided by 0.28, or about 36%. So if Bob's in the near neighborhood, our, our estimate is 36% chance that he's a terrorist. That's up from the 20% prior that we had before we looked at the graph. If he's not in the near neighborhood, now our estimate goes from 20% down to 14%. Well, that's not actually that great, right? 14% uh, is not enough to say, well, you know, we can ignore Bob. We don't need to investigate him anymore. Because a 14% chance that a given person is a terrorist is pretty bad. But 36% is, isn't really enough to arrest Bob either. It's not that much higher than 20%. Right? So what this says is, at least under these assumptions, um, looking at the graph in this way isn't really all that helpful. So why is that the case? In particular, why is it the case that this number in the upper right is only 36%? And the reason is, if you look at this graph, the problem is the size of this box here. This is the box, this is the case where Bob is in the neighborhood despite not being a terrorist. That's the false positives. False positives happen 18% of the time, and that's a bad thing. So how can we make the false positive rate lower? One way to do that is to shrink the size of the near neighborhood, because this is the case where he's in the near neighborhood just by chance. And so if we reduce the definition of near neighborhood to, say, a distance of two or less, now we go from a 22% chance that random people are in the near neighborhood to a 0.05% chance, way, way lower. And now our, now our chart looks like this. And you see up here 0.04% chance of, of a false positive. That's way lower. And now if we look at, at uh, what this method does, we see something different. That if Bob is in the near neighborhood um, of, of known bad guy, then there's a 99.6% chance that he's a terrorist. That's pretty high. That's enough to send the FBI out to Bob's house with the uh, sirens going. Uh, on the other hand, if he's not in the near neighborhood, there's about an 11% chance. Not really enough to rule him out. OK. So um, look at this. The president said on January 17th, effective immediately will only pursue phone calls that are two steps removed from a number associated with terrorism instead of the current three. So this was often sold as a, a big concession by the intelligence agencies, but in fact, it's a practice, we now know, a practice that they had already adopted for the reason, basically, that I described here. Yes, sir? Is that like the actual model that they use, or do they have more complications? Probably not. We don't know exactly what model they use. And I'll come back to how much the difference in models varies. The, um, the short version of it that is essentially all that matters is how big is the near neighborhood. Um, so. Facebook actually published the probability that two people are within two degrees and within three degrees. Yes. It's not that different. Not that, okay. Yeah. Well, that's it's, it's, it actually doesn't, it doesn't truncate the survey number that much. The, the difference between two hops and three hops, sure. Uh, because there's a lot of indirect connections. Or in other words, if A is connected to B and A is connected to C, yeah, it's highly clustered. That's right. Uh, the social network is highly clustered in terms of friendships. The belief is that the phone call network is less highly clustered because you sometimes call strangers for other reasons. But still, there is significant clustering. And this random graph model doesn't have clustering. Um, and that is a difference. And again, I'll come back to that. OK. Right. So this helps us to sort of understand why they might have gone to two hops. Now at this point, um, I've given this talk a few times before, and at this point there's always someone who's squirming in their seat and saying, wait a minute, how did we get, Bob is in the near neighborhood of this known bad guy, and that means there's a 99.6% chance that he's a terrorist? That seems really bad. That seems like a sort of guilt by association, right? Um, well, we need to shed some, um, it turns out it's not really that bad, because the 20% prior actually played a really important role. This 20% prior means essentially that the analyst has evidence that Bob is much, much, much more likely to be a terrorist than what you would otherwise have thought. So that 20, to get an idea of how much effect that 20% prior has in getting us to the result, we can say, well, what if we didn't have a 20% prior? What if we didn't know anything about Bob, except that he's a member of the population? Let's say that there's a one in a million chance that he's a terrorist. Um, so then what does it look like? Well, if, if you plug that in, now your chart looks like this. 
And now the probability that Bob's a terrorist if he's in the near neighborhood of known bad guy is about 0.1%, very small. And if he's not in the near neighborhood, well then we know almost, well then we cut our probability from one in a million to a half in a million. So what this says is it's not just being in the neighborhood of, of, of a known terrorist that caused us to point the finger so strongly at Bob. It's also whatever that other evidence was that got us from almost certainly not to 20%. All right, so conclusions so far on what we can, uh, uh, what we can get from this is that this kind of analysis might work reasonably well for narrowing down, what, uh, for confirming a suspicion that someone is, uh, is a bad guy, if in fact confirmation is indicated, if the neighborhood is small. Because it's the size of the near neighborhood that is the probability of a false positive that really controls, uh, that really controls this factor. On the other hand, um, this is not so good at eliminating suspicion. In none of these models were you able to get the probability that, the pro the probability that Bob is a bad guy down below about 10%, um, starting at a 20% prior. So it's not so good at ruling people out. And in fact, that's what the review group said based on talking to the NSA about actual cases that this method was not really effective at eliminating suspicion, but might be useful at confirming a suspicion. Is it a good intuition that you would get a similar qualitative result if you asked about what if there's a whole bunch of known bad guys? If you guys? asked about what, well, yes. Um, like you get a high right. false positive rate, you, you have this small radius. Th that gets a, it gets a little more complicated if you start with a cluster of, with you start with a bunch of bad guys. If they're clustered together, if you have a graph model where there's strong clustering and those bad guys are clustered together, um, in the limit of high clustering, then essentially a, a, a tight cluster of bad guys acts almost like a single bad guy from the standpoint of the probabilities. Um, but in the in-between case where there's some clustering, which is more realistic, um, then it gets a little more complicated. And I don't have a model for that. Right. If you're starting with one point with one known bad guy and going outward, then for the purposes of this kind of analysis, all that really matters is how big the near neighborhood is. Um, and everything else kind of falls out. Um, and so that's actually, uh, and, so th and so that actually tells you that the details of the model don't matter all that much um, in, in doing analysis at this, le at this level. If you're going to get more realistic multiple known bad guys or probability estimates that different people are bad guys and you're using clustering or if you're going to assume that terrorist networks have different clustering than non-terrorist networks, there's all kinds of things you could try to do. But I doubt that they're going to give you a lot more power than you get out of this kind of simple analysis. And in any case, um, we don't know that the intelligence agencies are using methods that are that sophisticated. Everything they've said publicly talks about exploring the graph out to a certain number of hops. Okay, so using other network structures maybe, um, maybe don't matter all that much. Okay, now we heard not that long ago about uh, a, another interesting fact about this program, and this is a claim which might or might not be true. I'd say more likely than not is true, but we can't be sure. That says that the uh, agency is collecting less than 30% of US call data, that they're collecting it from some carriers and not others. So you might ask, how does this affect the analysis? Well, you can model that. Suppose that, um, suppose that each node in your call graph is covered, that is you have data for it with probability C, then an edge is covered if either end of it is covered because for each phone call, it's recorded at the caller's location and at the callee's location. So if either end is covered, then, then you're gonna have access to information about that call. So you can, uh, you can do this, you can construct the covered graph, that is the subset of the graph that will be available to an entity that has, um, uh, that has a fraction C covered. And so it's easy to show that a two hop path survives in the covered graph with this probability written here. And so if we fill in numbers, say 25% coverage, you get about 30% of the edges in the graph survive. Or the 30% of the two hop paths survive. You can then adapt your, your model. Um, and um, by st this is what we had before. Um, if you adapt the model to say you have about 30% coverage, the numbers change to this. And qualitatively, it's not that different. That is, the probability that Bob is a terrorist, given that he's in the near neighborhood, is still the same, because it turns out you knock down both the true positive and the false positive case by the same fraction. By, um, by they're both multiplied by C. Uh, but the other case where you're trying to rule someone out, uh, your result is much weaker. Uh, and you get almost no ability to rule somebody out. 
All right. So that actually uh, shows that a lower coverage doesn't make much qualitative difference in the effectiveness of the program, which is maybe one reason why they're not so worried about, um, about reducing the coverage. Okay. But one, there's one additional question about this, which is why not use targeted subpoenas to analyze this information? Because in fact, if you wanted to know whether there's a two-hop path from Alice to Bob, or from Bob to known bad guy, uh, if you get if you know who, who Bob's connected to directly, and you know who known bad guy is connected to directly, and you, look, uh, and you look at those two sets, if there's an intersection between those sets, if there's someone that Bob is connected to that known bad guy is also connected to, then there's a two-hop path. But on the other hand, if their neighbor sets are disjoint, then there isn't a two-hop path. So this says if you're asking the question, is there a two-hop path from person A to person B, you can just use targeted subpoenas to get that information. And you don't need to actually collect the whole graph. Um, and so this, this sort of raises the question of why not do that. Now if you're doing clustering analysis or other things, you might need to have more information, but maybe not, depending on the nature of the analysis you're doing. Okay. Let me move on now to the second, um, uh, to the second uh, uh, part of this that came from the President's Review Group uh, report. And this is the recommendation of restructuring the NSA call data program. Uh, and the President picked this up in his speech on January 17th, he said, I instructed the intelligence community and the attorney general to develop options for a new approach that can match the capabilities and fill the gaps that the program is de designed to address. Without the government holding this metadata itself, they'll report back to me with options before March 28th. That's last Friday. And indeed they did. They reported back with options and the White House has decided to move forward with an approach uh, in this area, which I'll talk about. Um, this was the, this March 28th deadline and uh, everything around it was what led to these uh, statements about the program being shut down, which really involved the program being redesigned. But let's look at options for how to structure the program. Okay, so here's one way, here's how the program is structured now, very roughly speaking. Inside the National Security Agency, you have three big boxes. You have a box that stores the data. You have a box full of computers that analyzes the data. And then you have an analyst sitting here at a terminal sending queries. So the analyst will send a query that'll cause the, these computing nodes to, to grab a bunch of data, do some thinking, and then send back a result. Right? So if you want to break this up, one thing you can do is move the data outside the agency. Now this gray box on the right is the NSA, and the blue box is some non-government entity. So one thing you can do is you move the data outside the government into some kind of third party entity which, um, which acts as a kind of data custodian. Um, and um, then you're going to move it with inside in order to do the computing. So you just get the stuff that you need to get. This would meet the president's um, suggestion of the government not storing the data. As a computer scientist, you might not love this approach, but uh, nonetheless, it would meet the, the president's requirement. Um, so how would you actually do this? Well, in practice, it's probably already the case that there's some contractor who runs the data center that holds this data. And so all you do is tell that contractor, OK, now you're a data custodian. You revoke the badge access of NSA employees to that facility, and you say only the contractor people can get in, and now the contractor is the data custodian. Okay? So maybe it's not that big a change, and it might not matter that much from a privacy standpoint. Another thing you can do, of course, is move the computing in, outside of the agency to some external body. One thing to note is that whenever uh, lawyers or politicians tend to talk about a program like this, they focus on the data and the storage of the data, and they don't really talk about where the computing takes place. To us as computer scientists, it matters where the computing takes place because you have to pull data across a boundary in order to get it into this computer, at least in the previous model. Um, and if you need to pull all the data into the agency in order to compute on it, then you've maybe done less good from a privacy standpoint than you could otherwise do. But nonetheless, politicians talk about data storage and not about computing. Okay, so you could do this. Another thing you could do is this. Um, and that is, this is the idea that instead of having a data custodian that holds the data, who collects the data from the phone companies, you're just going to have the phone companies themselves keep the data. And uh, data is only going to be turned over to the government when it's needed. And so there are two versions of this. One version that was maybe suggested by the review panel report was the idea that um, the uh, phone companies would hold the data, but they might be required to retain the data for some length of time. NSA had previously been retaining the data for five years. Um, there was some discussion that they might reduce that to three years or two years. 
But uh, some of the, and the phone companies, it turns out, have different practices for how long they keep it. The FCC requires them to keep for 18 months data that affects the customer's bill. But to the extent that data doesn't affect the customer's bill, then it's not required, then there's not required retention at all. So there was some talk that there might be required retention. An alternative is to not have required retention, but just say the phone companies will hold the data and they should just keep it as long as they keep it. And if the government wants it, they'll send over a request. If the phone company has it, they'll turn over the data. So how do you choose between all of these things? Well, um, uh, you can think about this as a technology design problem and you can optimize for a bunch of things. You can optimize for all the things computer scientists like to optimize for performance, cost, reliability, but you also want to optimize for oversight. And oversight is basically the process by which various political and legal entities um, govern this process. So this is how does the White House make sure that they understand what's happening and retain control? How does Congress know what's going on and how do they exercise their oversight responsibilities? How in fact does the leadership of the NSA make sure that their people are doing what they think they're doing? So you want to optimize the design for oversight, which means you want to expose some aspects of the system's operation that an oversight entity would want to know. Okay. So based on all of this, we can come up with some design principles. Um, and, 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 the, and here are some. One is to avoid replication of the data. If you replicate the data in multiple places, there are more places from which it can leak. You have a larger set of people who might have, be able to abuse the data. There are generally more, more things that can go wrong. And so if you're worried about the information leaking or being abused by an insider, storing it in fewer places is a better idea. So avoid replication. For the same reason, try to avoid aggregating a lot of data in one place. That place becomes a central point of failure um, and it becomes a target for attackers and for insider abuse. Um, consider both storage and processing. That is, don't just, uh, don't just um, that to interpret the charge given to you or us as, us as academic analysts, if you will, by the president, as meaning think, to think about where the data will be stored and what's going to be done with it. To try to design for accountability to expose and log and make things auditable as much as possible. And actually then to use computer science to try to attack these problems. That is to think about algorithms and data structures, to think about how to use cryptography and logging and, uh, uh, and um, uh, commitments and all, all the sorts of tricks that computer scientists use to build reliable systems uh, to try to address this problem. So if you're going to go that way, uh, if you're going to think this way, the design that you like best is this one if it um, gives you the efficiency that you need. That is, you avoid replication, you avoid aggregation of data by keeping the data in the phone companies. This is in fact the one that the White House has chosen. But it's interesting to ask, um, uh, to look sort of abstractly, uh, what kinds of computations can be done reasonably within a model like this? Because if you think about computation, it's not, maybe not obvious in advance that it will turn out that you can do the analysis you need to do in this kind of system where the data is, is distributed. Okay, so um, let's look back then and ask for the computations we know they're doing on the call graph, how they would do that in this kind of distributed architecture. Well, remember we have two computations on the call graph, contact chaining and the redacted one. And as I said before, the contact chaining will be the easier one to analyze. But you'll be surprised how far we can get on the redacted one. Okay, contact chaining is actually not that difficult to think about. Contact chaining uh, uh, can be implemented, either is or can be implemented on top of breadth first search. You're looking at, you're doing essentially a breadth first search to explore the graph out to a certain distance. We know that whatever they're doing, they have said under oath that they don't explore the graph out to a depth of more than three, and now no more than two. And maybe they're doing an, um, clustering analysis and so on, but whatever algorithm there's you, they're using, it can be sort of put within the box of breadth first search up to depth two. And that's a thing that you can do relatively efficiently in this setting, um, just by sending a limited number of queries, no more than two queries, in fact, to each, uh, to each of the phone companies. Right, now let's talk about the redacted one. So in order to talk about the redacted one, we have to make some inferences from what we know about what they're doing and how they structure things. So one thing we think we know is that their system is, pr this, that the technology that they're using is probably set up to do MapReduce computation. We believe, based on public documents, that a lot of this data is stored in a system that uses, uh, based on a system called Accumulo, which is a um, specialized um, open source version of Hadoop which is one of the big MapReduce um, systems. So MapReduce computations essentially operate 
by taking each data item and doing a computation separately on each data item. That's the map step. And then by doing a reduce step that takes the results of those individual computations and combines them in a way that's logically pairwise through a kind of tree, all combining down to one result. So first it's map, which is highly parallel, and then you sort of combine the results down. Well, that works really well in a setting where the data is striped across a set of separate servers. You can do the map separately on each server. You can do the reduce locally within each server. And then you can combine those locally reduced um, results into a single global result. That works very efficiently. And in fact, that's the whole point of MapReduce, is it's designed to work very efficiently across a highly uh, distributed uh, uh, storage system. In fact, one much more distributed than this. So that to the extent that the algorithms they're using are structured as MapReduce and run effectively as MapReduce computations, then we know that they'll, in fact, run effectively on this architecture, whatever they are. So those would still be efficient. There are other kinds of specific algorithms they might be doing, like similarity search. Uh, suppose they're doing an algorithm, and, and this is actually a reasonable guess based on um, other stuff that we know, that they're doing an algorithm that asks this. They say, here is a graph of, uh, here is a, a node in the graph, and we want to find other nodes whose neighbor sets are very similar. So for example, this might model a case where you have a bad guy who's using a, a particular phone, and they throw that phone away and get a new one. Now, if you assume that their call pattern with the new phone is similar to what it was with the old phone, then, and you want to find phones that are candidates for being the new phone, what you want is to find a phone which went active at about the time the previous one went inactive, and which has a very similar neighbor set. And so the hard part of that is the similarity search, to find other nodes whose neighbor sets are similar to a node that you have. And it's an interesting homework problem to think about how to do this kind of similarity search efficiently in this kind of architecture. It's not that hard. It's something that you can do reasonably efficiently. And if you want to get really fancy, you can use crypto and bloom filters and so on to make it more efficient and uh, to try to hide information about what you're looking for. OK. Um, so um, other kinds of algorithms like this, if you think about specific algorithms they might be doing, such as similarity search, um, all the cases I've seen plausibly postulated here are algorithms that would run efficiently in this kind of distributed architecture. And in fact, the best confirmation we have that that's the case is the fact that the president has ordered that, or has asked that they move to this kind of distributed architecture. Now, you know, knowing how politics works and how politicians deal with technical trade-offs, it's not an absolute certainty that they can do something efficiently just because a politician ordered them to do it. Uh, but it's at least um, more likely. OK. Um, now, um, I want to move a little bit beyond the discussion of this particular program and talk more broadly about how it is that we structure access by intelligence agencies to data. I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we might try to change the debate and to give an example from new research that we actually just released today. Um, the usual debate about these programs is really about security and privacy. How can we trade security off about, against privacy? How can we get better security without giving up privacy or vice versa? And so on. It's about this two-dimensional trade-off. But in fact, it's really important in thinking about how these systems are designed to bring in the dimension of accountability. Um, and that is to try to get to a place where not only do we have a good trade-off between security and privacy, but also the system is designed in such a way that it exposes information that helps the oversight process, that helps the political entities that are supposed to be governing how these agencies operate to do their jobs. So that the agency is a little bit less of a black box to the House and Senate Intelligence Committee and the White House National Security Staff. And in, in cases where information can be released, a little bit less of a black box to the public. Uh, and so one uh, discussion that's, that's happened around that, that space is a question of how to support the execution of search warrants. Uh, and um, the first writing I saw about this from a computer scientist recently was by Seni Kamara, who's a cryptographer at Microsoft Research. And he wrote a blog post back in July that proposed a certain um, algorithm for executing simple warrants. A simple warrant basically is the idea that you have a court order which tells a phone company to give information about a particular phone number to the NSA. So he came up with this algorithm, which is actually pretty interesting in some ways, to allow accountable execution of simple warrants. And so the algorithm works like this, that the telecom company is going to take their database, they're going to encrypt every item of the database with a different key that's generated in a certain way. 
and then give all those encrypted elements to the NSA. Now, when the court wants to issue a warrant, the court will publicly commit, cryptographically commit to the warrant, which you can think of as publishing a sealed version of the warrant, um, but a sealed version that the court can later unseal if they're challenged to reveal what the original warrant is. And the key thing about this commitment or sealing is that they can't change what they committed to once they have committed. So the court commits to what the warrant will be in a way that is checkable later. And then they'll send the NSA essentially a key that will allow them to unlock the commitment. Now the NSA knows what the commitment is. They know what the warrant was for. And now in this, in, um, in the, this algorithm, you, you use this giant ha uh, cryptographic hammer called secure multi-party computation, which allows the NSA and the phone company to jointly execute a computation in which the telecom company puts in information about their key material, and the NSA puts in secret information like what the warrant is for, and they turn the crank and a bunch of crypto magic, and the crypto fairy visits and, and, uh, and, uh, and gives you a result in which uh, you have verified that the warrant matches the requested number that the agency was trying to get information for, that it calculates what the key is that would unlock that record and gives that key to the NSA while, inf while informing nobody else of anything else. And then given that, the NSA decrypts the record of the requested number. So this is pretty cool. It's more accountable. There's a public commitment to the warrant. You limit who learns what. The NSA only gets access to the things that has warrants for. That's actually pretty cool, but this algorithm has some drawbacks. Um, and actually, just today, with my student Josh Kroll and Dan Bonet from Stanford, we published this paper called Secure Protocols for Accountable Warrant Execution, uh, which offers improved methods for doing this. Uh, so basically, we start with this idea that you want a secure, accountable way to execute warrants, and you improve it in a few ways. So one of the ways we improved it is to make a system that's more robust against a break of the encryption. So if you are watching carefully in the previous algorithm, the first step is you encrypt all of the records and you give them to the NSA. Now, encrypting all of the records and giving them to the people who are the best people in the world at breaking codes might not be the smartest move, right? Because if, if the agency can break that code, break that crypto, and if they're willing to do so, which is a, you know, a substantial assumption, but if they can and choose to do so, then they can get access to everything. Um, and maybe that's not the best way to keep them from getting access to everything. So uh, one of the improvements that we made is, a me is methods that are more robust against a break of the crypto. So that if the agency can break the crypto that you use to encrypt individual records, then they can get access to a different record than the one they got a warrant for. That is, they can get a warrant for record A, but actually read warrant at record B. But they only get to sort of pick once from the, uh, from the cookie jar uh, for each warrant that they get. Uh, so you can limit the amount of damage that's done to be basically uh, a number of records equal to the number of warrants. So that's useful. Uh, other improvements have to do with things like having fewer long-term secrets. One of the things you want in a protocol like this is you, want, you don't want parties to have to keep certain things secret for, for a long time. Because it's really hard to keep something secret for a long, long time, especially if you're worried about highly sophisticated adversaries. And so we can change the protocol in various ways so certain people don't need to keep long-run secrets so that they know only public keys, for example. And then finally, we have improvements that allow us to uh, eliminate the secure multi-party computation step. So instead of the crypto fairy having to come and give you a giant, giant gift, now the crypto fairy only has to come and give you a medium-sized gift, which is um, uh, auditable, ob auditable, accountable, oblivious transfer. So a, a less, less, um, less extreme um, and more efficient um, uh, exotic cryptography in our algorithm, which in the crypto world counts as an improvement. Okay. But one of the things that we're able to do based on this is show that the method that we describe is actually feasible at scale. Uh, that to, uh, to apply this to one day's worth of data for all phone calls in the US takes about 820 core hours. So if a core, if a rack of computers, if a single rack has about 500 cores, which is a good estimate, then a single rack of computers is able to do all the crypto needed to handle all the phone calls in the US in, uh, in about an hour and 40 minutes. And that's, maybe that's maybe not too bad. So it requires substantial computing, but compared to the potential privacy benefit, it's, and compared to the amount of computing that, say, a phone company like Verizon or an agency like the NSA has, it's a drop in the bucket. 
So there's some, um, this, this, is, um, this is a new research result and, um, and we'll be developing it more as we go forward. But this is the idea of the kind of thing you can do to try to apply tools of computer science to get better trade-offs between security, privacy, and accountability. All right. Now I want to close by talking about ways in which the, um, in which the debate is, has been changed in a favorable way. Um, and I want to start, though, by, by talking about this um, op-ed piece that hasn't been noticed that much. But this is a piece by Walter Pincus in the Washington Post that ran on Christmas Day. Uh, and Walter Pincus is a national security reporter who is very, um, who has, is very experienced and very well connected in the intelligence community. He's really in touch with how people in the intelligence community think. And this op-ed was his attempt, and, and you don't need to read it. I'm going to blow off the parts that are most important in a minute. Um, but this was his attempt to describe how some people in the intelligence community think about these issues. So he asks this. Um, and again, um, well, should the US engage in secret, covert, or clandestine activity if the American public can't be convinced of the necessity and wisdom of such activities? Should they be leaked or disclosed? To intelligence professionals, that's a bizarre question. Now, I could understand if you said it's a hard question, it's an interesting question, it's a question worthy of debate, right? Now, I actually believe that the answer to this question is probably not. But um, it seems odd to me that this question would be considered bizarre. That the idea of that you might require um, democratic uh, acceptance by the population of what you're doing um, is, should not be considered a bizarre question in a democracy. Um, he goes on to say this, and again, this is summarizing the view of many in the intelligence community, according to him. The prime reason for secrecy is that you don't want the targets to know what you're doing. That makes total sense, right? Um, but often in democracies, another reason is that you don't want your citizens to know what their government is doing on their behalf to keep them secure, as long as it's within their country's laws. Uh, and this, again, seems kind of worrisome. Um, and the reason it's worrisome is that these agencies come and they ask to, they ask for laws that grant, them, um, that grant them discretion to do certain things. They say, it should be legal for us to do X, because we will sometimes need to do X in an emergency. So if you then say it's legal to do X because it's sometimes necessary, then it's not enough to simply say something is legal if you want to go ahead and do it. So we have here, at least as evidenced in this, uh, in this piece, by someone who I think is pretty well informed, um, evidence that the opinions in the intelligence community are maybe not where they should be on these issues. Um, but I want to close with this quote um, from James Clapper, who's the director of national intelligence, who gave a, um, an interview about a month ago, uh, which took a different approach. Um, and he said this. He said, the problems facing the intelligence community over its collection of phone records could have been avoided. I probably shouldn't say this. This, by the way, when someone in Washington says this, it means they're about to say something interesting. <laughs> but I will. Had we been transparent about this from the outset, right after 9-11, which is the genesis of this program, uh, and said both to the American people and to their elected representatives, we need to cover this intelligence gap. We need to make sure this never happens, this 9-11 never happens to us again. So here is what we're going to set up. Here is how it's going to work and why we have to do it. And here are the safeguards. If we had done that, we wouldn't have had the problem we had. Uh, and I think that's true. That had that happened, we could have had a discussion here um, within the political system about what to do. Now, probably right after 9-11, we would have said this program is OK. And, uh, and the political system would have allowed it to go forward. But as time passed, and as we got a different perspective, and as time passed without more attacks, I think we would have changed our minds. And the point would have come where when these programs came up for periodic renewal, which they have, um, we would have had a new debate about it. And we might have been able to get to a point where uh, whether or not we went ahead with the program, at least there was a sense that it reflected the will of the people as expressed through the political system. So I think interviews like this are actually really important signs that we might be moving toward a healthier debate about these issues within the US. And I think that's the best news of all. And if we move toward a healthier debate, uh, then I think it's important for people with different kinds of expertise, including people who know about computer science and are able to analyze the security, uh, privacy, and accountability of these sorts of systems uh, to get into the fray and to be involved in the debate. Thanks.
think we have time for questions way in the back. So, uh, can you run one slide? Sure. So, the, one of the really important things I think I read on here is that we need to cover this gap. Yes. Right? And, and justifying that to me is the very difficult part. Justifying that, so the question is, right, is this assertion by Mr. Clapper that we need to cover this gap? There's the question of what is the gap and how does it need to be covered? See, it seems to me that in the past, yes. uh, investigative crimes has, has had a scalability problem. Mm -hmm. And that has been a feature of, but, of the criminal justice system because it has, it has prevented you know, the, the law enforcement from going after targets really known. Yes. And, and so what we've seen over the past few decades is that that scalability threshold has been reduced a great deal, mm -hmm. right? And, and we don't, we no longer have that built-in, you know, rate limiter essentially. Sure. Um, right. So the scalability makes a huge difference, and the ability of an agency to store all of this data, to run analysis over it at scale, it on a you know regular computer, and indeed you can do interesting analysis of a data set this size on your laptop now. Um, that is a game changer. Um, and, um, you know, we see reports of these programs that record all phone calls, all contents of all phone calls um, in, uh, in, in an entire country. Um, that will be possible worldwide pretty soon. Uh, and so we have to make decisions that we didn't have to make before. Um, uh, that's true. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and that is a game changer. Um, we're also seeing some changes. So there are different kinds of changes that that suggests, right? So one kind of change that I think is more defensible is the idea that um, we might need the ability to have a targeted search for information or a targeted disclosure of information that's based on something rather than other than the identity of the individual. So it's one thing to say that we need to know which individual we're investigating, right? Um, it's a second thing to say we need to get data about everybody just in case. But it's a third thing to say, here we have a very specific criterion which will apply almost never, but we have a good reason to want the data where that criterion applies. And you have some oversight, right. So for example, if you know that a certain very unlikely phrase is being used as a code word by some um, hostile organization, you might um, ask for a warrant to get access to every phone call where that phrase is said, right? And if that is something that hardly ever happens, um, then you could justify that, you could have oversight, and you could hope that the general principle that a warrant ought to be targeted can be, um, can be met even though it's not targeted to an individual. Um, but it's true that the idea of just turning it all over and sorting it out later is not a mode of operation that really exists. So uh, I, ha I actually have a comment about the scalability issue. Uh, it worries me somewhat that as a law enforcement the definition of a criminal or a terrorist might become cheaper as well, and, and, it, and it becomes te more tempting to survey people with lower probabilities and, and yeah. smaller crimes. It's, uh, it's sort of this, this side effect of a lower cost. Sure. That's right. So they might, and it's, it kind of relates to the point of the previous question as well, in a sense, which is that it used to be that the cost of surveillance was a key limiting factor, and it's not anymore. That's true, so you have all those options. One of them is you can define down what the standard is. Um, the standard already for intelligence surveillance is quite low. Um, it's um, for many, there are whole law review articles written about which standard applies where, but roughly speaking, it's common to apply what's called reasonable articulable suspicion standard, which basically means you have to be able to say why you're doing it. This is essentially the same standard, it, and, it's, and it's a reason that in practice, what it means is you have to be able to say why, and it has to be a reason that wouldn't make a reasonable person burst out laughing. Um, this is more or less the standard that's required for a police officer to stop you and ask you a question on the street. Um, and it's a pretty low standard. Um, and that's one of the things that's happened in intelligence is absolutely that the standard is very low, and so they can gather a lot of data. And in fact, there are people who argue that none of these restrictions will matter because intelligence agencies can sweep in huge amounts of data even under the standards that are already allowed. Um, I think you were next. So when we look at the um, public list of reasons, we won't debate too much. Yes. Um, my question is, to what extent does this kind of surveillance help predict, I mean, help the investigate of just the public being terrorist before you actually, you know, multiply that by the sure. public? Sure. Yeah. That's the most interesting to 
Mm -hmm. So uh, one way of thinking about that question is to look at the, um, the, case, the, the case where you have a one in a million prior, right? Which is essentially saying we're, which is more or less the order of magnitude, right? The, the background rate for the whole population. If you assume 300 terrorists in the US, which seems to me high, but let's go with it. Um, that you get to still a very tiny probability that someone is, um, that someone is, a, um, uh, is a bad guy. Like 0.1% probability in the two hop model that I used. Uh, so still quite low. Uh, does that give you enough to go get their records under current law? I don't know, uh, actually. But um, you could use it to try to bootstrap up to getting more data. Um, that is, that's possibly a concern. But you don't get to a very high confidence if you start with. with Ed, my home phone number is one digit away from Lebanon Village Pizza. So I get a lot of wrong numbers for Lebanon Village Pizza. Yeah. And then Dave calls me at home to yell at me for a while. And what happens now is that Dave is now two hops away from a terrorist who happens to make a wrong number when he's trying yeah. to get pizza. Uh -huh. So it seems like the call graph should have a notion of weights on the end. Yes. Yeah, so there are, various, there are various things that have to do with weighting. And this is actually one thing that we know that the NSA does, which is that they identify high degree nodes like the pizza place, and they actually remove those from the graph. Um, or you could have some kind of, you know, you can imagine the various different scoring and weighting algorithms where you, uh, you give a connection a very low weight if that node has a high degree. Because um, in fact, there are some nodes that have extremely high degree, like airline customer service. Um, or um, actually, a T-Mobile voice, voicemail is probably the highest degree node in the US. Uh, it's a single number um, that, uh, that your phone calls, um, as I understand it. So. Um, yeah, so you want to either take those out or you want to downweight them a lot. Um, absolutely. But wrong numbers, right. So there's all kinds of weird things that happen by chance. And um, you just, you know, you just, and that's the nature of the data. So I think a lot of the discussion around this has, has, has been about you know, legality mm -hmm. of, of what NSA has been allegedly uh, doing. Um, but there's not been a lot about this, like, really they have the infrastructure to do this? And if they have the infrastructure to do this without, apparently, as far as I understand, the companies knowing it, is there really ever anything that one could do to, ah. to, to, to prevent them? The infrastructure to collect the data directly, yes. The hardware, I don't know, how does this actually work? Overseas, there's, ah. So domestically, the way it works is pretty straightforward. They get a court order. And they take it to the company, and the company has to give them the data every day. That's right. Domestically, the companies, uh, yeah, the companies know it's happening, and the companies, the companies actively deliver the data because the court has ordered them to do that on a daily basis. Um, internationally, they collect the data by various ways, um, presumably mostly by listening on wires, but also probably by um, cyber intrusion in some settings. Um, and we've learned some things about the kinds of intrusions and the kinds of collection capabilities. Um, from this standpoint, it's interesting that they're able to collect essentially all phone calls in uh, at least some country of interest, um, which odds are good it's probably Iraq um, or possibly Afghanistan. Um, and you, you know, it's interesting to think about how it is that you could have 100% confidence that you have all phone calls in that company, country. Um, and, access to not only the metadata, but also content, right? You have to be listening on certain wires in order to do that, probably, and probably a lot of wires. Uh, so there's no doubt. Now, the law constrains a lot what they can do domestically. Domestic collection without some sort of court order or legal authorization is, um, um, domestic collection about Americans' communications is, uh, is something that, in general, they can't do without special authorization. Um, I think you sort of. <coughs> yeah, I'm a retired executive of the National Security Agency. I'm uh -huh. very familiar with the issues. As a matter of fact, I have given a presentation here at Dartmouth back in November okay. after examining this issue in some detail. Uh -huh. um, you really haven't gone into depth enough on the controls that are placed upon NSA by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court and by the forms of oversight that exist in all three branches of this government. Uh, and the fact that NSA really does have, because I was one of the ones that helped institute this, a culture of rigid conformance with the laws in the country. 
One of the things that I used to insist that all of my analysts, and I headed up what was the largest post-Cold War analytic element in the society, that they understood the Fourth Amendment, and they understood all of the laws that evolved from the force of the Fourth Amendment. And all of the collection done in accordance with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is rigidly obeying the law. I think you need to emphasize that a bit more. I agree with some of your mathematical analysis to the extent that I understand it. Uh, but I would also say that you, you know, the, the mathematical analysis to determine who may or may not be associated with a terrorist, um, and I need to get in that a little bit more, is far more than just mathematical. There sure. are multiple forms of analysis that are applied so that you're absolutely sure that you are focusing on an individual who, in all probability, has got a connection here of some form. Mm -hmm. And NSA, by the way, can only identify a number based on what the court allows, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. They must first convince the court that the number they are using to interrogate the metadata is truly associated with a foreign terrorist organization or a foreign terrorist, all right? Let's say it's in Yemen, because there are not multiple units in Yemen that you can talk about. They have to convince the court this number in Yemen is calling somebody in the United States. Mm -hmm. We need permission to interrogate the metadata database to discover who this might be. That's all NSA can do, is to identify that telephone number. They then must hand that over to the FBI, and the FBI takes it from there, because NSA has no responsibility or authority to operate domestically against American citizens. It is illegal for it to do so. So let, let me take that in pieces. Um, the first piece as to the culture of compliance, I agree with that. Um, and thank goodness, uh, because we'd be in a much worse position if we didn't have a strong culture of compliance within the agency. Um, now that said, that, you know, the uh, wanting to comply and is um, uh, is super important, but um, in a case where the rules and the technology are complicated, you see, we've seen quite a number of failures to comply, which are always fixed when discovered. But nonetheless, that's an issue of concern. Um, but certainly I agree that the culture of compliance is there and is super important. That's one of the lessons that the agency learned in the 70s, right? Um, number one, okay. Um, so the second piece, I think, is um, about um, all the different means that are available to try to identify who is and isn't a terrorist. And also, I, I agree with that, that there are all kinds of sources of intelligence that can be used and followed up in different kinds of analysis. And I did absorb all of that in the discussion here into this sort of idea of a prior, the 20% prior or whatever. That reflected the result of all the other intelligence sources and so on. And so what I was really looking at here is what is the extra ability that comes from this kind of analysis. But absolutely, um, and one of the, I think, lessons of this analysis is that without those other sources, you're really in trouble. Because this by itself is not going to do it. Um, as to what's required for NSA to look at data r related to a particular phone number, um, I think it's actually more complicated than what you said. That, um, that when data comes in from the phone company, according to the FISA court orders, it goes into uh, what's called the collection store, uh, which is, uh, uh, which you can think of as being one database. Um, and then uh, queries against that collection store have to be authorized by the FISA court in the way you said. You need, or you need to establish reasonable articulable suspicion through a certain process, formal process. And once that's done, then a query can happen against the collection store. And then the results of that query, all of the results, can be moved into a separate place called the corporate store. Um, and within the corporate store, there are much uh, more permissive rules about access and analysis. And so um, as the FISA court rulings have been structured so far, the agency can ask, can do a query against this collection store for a targeted number with RAS authorization and ask for everything within two hops or everything within three hops, and that whole subgraph is, is the result of a query and can be put into the uh, corporate store uh, under those rules. And that means that large amounts of information that are associated with numbers that are where there's not direct reasonable articulable suspicion, but just indirect through well, one or two hop indirection, 
can end up in the corporate store. Under the rule, I think that's very rare, and there's very rigid control of the interrogation of the metadata database. There are 22 analysts who can do that, and it's restricted to that, and they are rigidly trained on what is legal and what is illegal, what they can do with the data, and where else it might go. That is strictly controlled. Uh, well, well, we, we can discuss this more offline. Um, the, um, what precisely the rules are. Um, I think, though, it's indisputable that analysts are able to look at data from people who, from, uh, people who are near those for whom there's reasonable articulable suspicion. So in, um, in the, uh, the accidental pizza call scenario, um, that, um, that the uh, information about individuals who just happen to be connected um, by, by a call um, can end up in the hands of an analyst, and the court rulings as they exist um, don't, um, don't prevent that. So there is concern about uh, how far the analysis can go from a, from a starting point, and I don't think that's really been addressed by the political oversight as of yet. But we can continue this conversation offline. Thank you.